Hi there, I'm Adam Burton, and I'm the pastor at Central Baptist Church in Maysville, Kentucky. Thank you for tuning in to my online Bible study from The Gospel Project. We are live every Thursday night to study God's Word. This week's Bible study is titled, A Servant Receives God's Promise. We will see that God promised that He would give His people the true King they needed and fulfilled that promise in Jesus. To let you know where we're going, here are our three points. First, God promises to give His people eternal rest. Second, God promises to establish an eternal kingdom. And third, God promises to provide an eternally beloved Son. We'll get to our Bible study in just a moment, but before we do, one of the great things about our online Bible study is that we can engage in conversation. So as you watch, let me know what comments or questions you might have. Let us know what sticks out to you in this study. And lastly, we would love to connect with you on all of the socials. We are active on Facebook and Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. Just search for CBC Maysville. Okay, let's get to our Bible study. On July 4th, 1952, Florence Chadwick, age 34, stepped into the cold waters of the Pacific Ocean off Catalina Island to go swimming. Now, this was not a recreational swim, but a challenge swim. She wanted to be the first woman to swim the 21-mile channel between Catalina Island and the California coastline. The physical challenge was daunting. The visible and invisible sea creatures, including the sharks circling her, were intimidating. But the fog hemmed her in. She could hardly see her support boats that carried her mother, her trainer, and her support staff. And though they could uh, encourage her to keep her going, the fog ended her challenge. After swimming 15 hours and 55 minutes, exhausted, she asked to be taken out of the water. Sitting in the boat, she found out she only had a half mile left to reach her destination. Later, she told a reporter, Look, I'm not excusing myself, but if I could have seen land, I know I could have made it. Surely we can relate with Chadwick when, at times, we are so fatigued by life, so physically, emotionally, and spiritually drained, that we feel as if we can go no further and want to give up. But in these times, more than ever, we need to fix our gaze on the promises of God and what lies ahead of us because of our faith in Christ. We need to consider our circumstances in light of the eternal future God has for us. Why might it be difficult to fix our eyes on eternal things instead of what is immediately before us? Maybe it's because our priorities are wrong or our sin lowers our gaze in shame. You know, it takes spiritual discipline to set our minds on things above, and, and we've not trained ourselves well to do so. We live isolated lives without meaningful connection with those who could help us. In this session, we will see God deny David's plan to build the temple and instead promise to give David and Israel blessings that would extend beyond this life into the next. God was showing David that he would remain faithful to his promises despite the frequent faithlessness of his people. We will see that these promises also come to us who believe in the greater David, Jesus Christ. In Christ, all the promises of God find their yes. Therefore, we have hope beyond this life. And if we keep our eyes on the future God has for us, we can endure to the end. Our first point is that God promises to give His people eternal rest. God promises to give His people eternal rest. David brought the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem, but it remained in a tent. David wanted to build a house for the Lord, but the Lord said no on account of his years as a warrior king, and because the Lord had not commanded that to be done. Yet the Lord had more to say. So through the prophet Nathan, God said he would make a house, a dynasty for David. The foundation of this house was God's promise to give Israel what she had longed for, rest. Read with me 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 8-11a. through 11a. 
Now therefore, thus you shall say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, that you should be prince over my people Israel. And I have been with you wherever you went, and have cut off all your enemies from before you. And I will make for you a great name, like the name of the great ones of the earth. And I will appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them so that they may dwell in their own place and be disturbed no more. And violent men shall afflict them no more as formerly from the time that I appointed judges over my people. And I will give you rest from all your enemies. When the Israelites were slaves in Egypt centuries before, God promised that He would take them out of a land of slavery to a land that had rest on every side. Now, generations later, the Lord brought rest to the battle-scarred, blood-soaked land through David. But as we see in God's promise to David, God had something much more profound in mind for His people. The rest they were experiencing was incomplete. It was a shadow of the substance that was yet to come. You know, if we think deeply, we realize that the rest we long for is not just physical, neither is it just emotional. There is a kind of rest that a vacation can never really provide. We need a more profound rest that gets beneath the surface and refreshes our very soul. We need a spiritual rest, a complete rest rooted in the Lord and in Him alone. God had given David rest in the land as king, yet God also promised a coming rest, a future rest, a complete rest. God was not done offering rest for His people because His people still did not have the rest He desired to give them. Through Moses, God's people were brought out of slavery, but they had not yet entered their promised rest. So the promise was reiterated time and time again for 40 years. Through Joshua, God brought His people into the land and gave them victory over their enemies, leading to a limited rest in the land. But the Lord allowed some nations to remain to test them, test that they failed. Through the judges, God preserved His people and disciplined them so that they might turn from their evil ways and pursue Him alone. How can we be at rest physically, but still be spiritually restless? Well, we can enjoy being in our sin. We can settle for satisfaction and fulfillment in anything other than God. We can find ourselves coasting through life without regard for spiritual matters. Taking God's promises to David here as a whole, otherwise known as the Davidic covenant, we see that rest would come through someone in David's lineage. This rest would begin in this life and reverberate into the next. We know that the descendant who would provide this rest is Jesus Christ, the son of David. And we know that Jesus did not come just to provide this rest for the nation of Israel, but for all who trust in him as savior and king. Listen to this quote. Awake, you everlasting spirit, out of your dream of worldly happiness. Did not God create you for himself? Then you cannot rest till you rest in him. Jesus referred to himself as the Lord of the Sabbath, the day of the Lord's rest in creation. And in doing so, he declared that the rest that God promised, the rest that we need, is found in him. As the Lord of all rest, Jesus provided the rest that we long for and need by dying in our place to redeem us from all that enslaves us into this world. On the cross, Jesus uttered something very important regarding this rest. It is finished. Not I am finished, not even you are finished. It is finished. Jesus was speaking of the work that the Father had given him to do. So with his final breath on the cross, Jesus declared that he had completed all the work necessary. There is nothing left for him to do and surely nothing for us to do. This absence of work, rest, comes through Christ's completed work on the cross. Just as God rested on the seventh day after He completed the work of creation, so Jesus rested after He accomplished the work of redemption. What is more, one day Jesus will return to make all things new, to wipe away every tear, and to bring us to a place where we will never feel restless again. 
What are some ways we attempt to work for eternal salvation as if Christ's work on the cross was incomplete? We do good works to try to earn God's favor, don't we? We punish ourselves for our sin, or we view our good works and evil works on a scale trying to maximize our good ones. We try to build something for God to make us worth God's time. Our second point is God promises to establish an eternal kingdom. God promises to establish an eternal kingdom. Read with me 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 11b through 13. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. When your days are fulfilled and you, you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you, who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build the house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. The promise made here first came to fruition through David's son, Solomon, but only partially. Solomon would be the one who would build the temple that David wanted to build. But Solomon's throne was not forever. Besides the fact that Solomon died, his kingdom was torn in two on account of his disobedience. Yet his son would reign after him over a part of the kingdom because of God's promise to David. A greater king was needed to bring about perfect peace and establish the eternal kingdom of God that God spoke of. This promise could only be fulfilled in Christ Jesus. Solomon's name may have meant peace, but he would not be the one to bring it. Jesus, however, is the Prince of Peace who brought lasting peace with God. Jesus is the King of Kings who has planted His kingdom on earth, a kingdom that will have no end. Jesus is the sinless Savior who unites all of those who trust in Him, people of every tribe, tongue, and nation, as one redeemed people, the family of God. And Jesus is the Son of David to build the greater fulfillment of the temple. First, His body was raised from the dead on the third day after His crucifixion for sinners, followed second by the body of Christ, the church. What are some Old Testament prophecies we have already studied that find their ultimate fulfillment in Christ Jesus? Will the son of the woman to crush the head of the serpent, Abraham's blessing to the whole world, and God would raise up a prophet like Moses? God promised he would build an eternal kingdom. This kingdom began with David and Israel but it is being completed by Jesus through His church. While the church is not the kingdom, the church is an expression of the kingdom and evidence that the kingdom of God has come near. Through the church, the body of believers, God's name is honored, Jesus is worshiped, and His gospel is proclaimed. Wherever these happen, God's kingdom is present and moving in the name of our King Jesus and in the power of His Holy Spirit. Listen to this essential doctrine, Christ and kingdom. The church and the kingdom of God are closely related, though not identical. When the Bible speaks of the kingdom of God, it is referring to the reign of God in the world. The church is the people of God who live under His loving rule, now anticipating the full manifestation of God's kingdom in the future. The church's mission is to witness to God's kingdom, proclaiming God's message of salvation through Christ and demonstrating the power of the gospel through good works so that others may be brought to live under God's reign. A local church is like an outpost or an embassy of the kingdom. An embassy is one nation's presence in another nation. Now, this is not a figurative presence either. It is literal. An embassy's grounds are considered sovereign soil of that nation. The ambassador who serves in an embassy is considered to speak directly for his or her nation's leader. In the same way, when a local church honors Jesus as king, the world is able to see the kingdom of God among the kingdoms of this world. So, the promise God made to David about an eternal kingdom is advanced in the church that Jesus is building on earth, which will last into eternity. Jesus Christ was raised from the dead and given power and dominion far above the things for the sake of His bride, His body, the church. Through Jesus and His church, God is making good on His promise to David to usher in an eternal kingdom. 
May we view the church as God's plan in the world and labor in love to join with her in what God is doing to complete and fill the kingdom of the Son He loves. Our last point is God promises to provide an eternally beloved Son. God promises to provide an eternally beloved Son. Read with me 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 14-16. through 16. I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. When he commits iniquity, I will discipline him with the rod of men, but the stripes of the son of men. But my steadfast love will not depart from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I put away from before you. And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever." Again, Solomon is the first person in mind here, the builder of the Lord's temple. Imagine the blessing of being described as God's child with an everlasting love. I mean, do you have to imagine? I mean, Solomon did turn aside from following the Lord as he was disciplined, as the Lord said. Yet Solomon remained in God's love as a son while he suffered the consequences. And one day, the greater and perfect son of David, the unique son of God who had come to be disciplined, not for his wrongdoing, but for ours. Though Solomon's kingdom was split in two and his descendants ruled on a limited throne, God was still faithful to his promises to David. For God was speaking about Solomon, but he was not only speaking about Solomon. He was also speaking about someone much greater than Solomon. Jesus spoke about himself in this way. The queen of the south will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For she came from the ends of the earth to bear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, something greater than Solomon is here. That's Matthew chapter 12, verse 42. As great as David was, as great as Solomon was, no king, prophet, or leader who came before measured up to God's promises because they were all sinful men and women in need of a Savior themselves. There has never been one like Jesus, nor will there ever be another like Him. Why might we view discipline from God as a lack or loss of love from our Heavenly Father? Maybe it's because we don't have a faith relationship with Him through Jesus the Son. Because human parents can struggle to discipline their children in love. Maybe because we don't view our sin in the same way that God does, as serious and needing correction, or because we struggle to equate the pain of discipline as something good from our loving Father's hand. God didn't just send us information or steps to follow to find salvation. God sent us a person, His own Son, and He didn't send His Son merely as a messenger, but as the message Himself. Through Jesus' sinless life, sacrificial death, and resurrection, the Father has provided all we need to believe and experience forgiveness of sin and have eternal life with Him in the eternal kingdom He promised to David and Jesus Christ. In reading 2 Samuel chapter 7, we are able to see the riches of God's promises to David, eternal rest, an eternal kingdom, and an eternal king, all of which are fulfilled in Christ. This makes Jesus worthy of our complete trust and wholehearted obedience. What is more, these promises extend to us and then move us through and beyond us. We live in a world filled with restlessness, broken promises, and unmet expectations, and yet we have a King who fulfills His promises and always makes good on His word. May we offer our entire lives to point people to this eternal Son and His glorious kingdom and exhort them to enter into the rest only He provides. Because we have experienced the mercy and grace of our King, we offer ourselves fully to His service so that we might reveal Jesus Christ to the world and that others would find everlasting rest in His kingdom. Here are some ways for you to apply God's Word to your life. How will you respond to the Son of David, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who laid down His life to save sinners? How can your church encourage and challenge one another to live with an eye on eternity rather than merely on today? 
Who is struggling with spiritual restlessness with whom you can share this week about the rest found in Jesus by faith? Listen to this quote. If the Lord be with us, we have no cause of fear. His eye is upon us, his arm over us, his ear open to our prayer, his grace sufficient, his promise unchangeable. Pray with me. Father, our hearts are restless until we find the king who can provide true and lasting rest. Thank you for providing that king in Jesus, the true son of David. Help us to live daily in the view of privilege, of the privilege of being members of Christ's kingdom as we serve the church and announce our king's rightful reign to those who need to repent and join his family. Amen. Thank you for watching this week's Bible study. Remember that God promised that he would give his people the true king they needed and fulfilled that promise in Jesus. God promised David that future kings of Israel would come from his family and that his kingdom would last forever. God kept this promise by sending Jesus as the one of David's descendants. All of history is driving toward the day when Jesus, the son of David, will be recognized as the king whose kingdom is everlasting. Connect with me if you would like to know how Jesus can change your life forever. Would you like to, to dig even deeper into this week's Bible study? Well, join our online Bible study Facebook group where you will get a short study each day to help you to dig deeper into God's Word. You can find us at facebook.com slash groups slash OBS Central. Facebook.com slash groups slash OBS Central. Lord willing, I will see you next Thursday for our online Bible study.